Well, hello, I'm Debbie Kitterman, and welcome to Dare to Hear the Podcast, where we encourage you and challenge you to dare to hear the voice of God. Well, I am excited to introduce to you my next guest with a very timely message for us. His name is David Slyker. He has been an executive leader, speaker, and author at the International House of Prayer Missions Base in Kansas City, Missouri, for nearly 20 years. He is the vice president of the International House of Prayer University and ministers around the world. David and his wife, Tracy, have four children, Riley, Lauren, Daniel, and Finney. For more information, you can visit him at his website, and we'll have all of that in the show notes. But David, thank you for coming, and welcome to Dare to Hear the Podcast today. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I was really excited, and so was all of my family as we were talking about this off off air uh, about your new book, The Nation's Rage. And as I saw the title, I knew that I was like, this is such a right now message. And so I wanted to talk to you about this because I'm a chosen author, you're a chosen author. And what people don't really understand is that there is this timetable that we have to go through before the book actually releases. So I know that it's about 18 months from the time you sign the contract and then you go through the process and the book is released. And so, but the message had been burning in you long before that. So can you talk a little bit about me? Because when we're with us and to me about that, because in 2020, it's like, of course, the nation's rage, such a perfect thing. But God gave you this message long before we were in 2020. So can you talk about that and how it relates to our current climate? Yeah, um, you know, it's funny because the, the subject in the general sense, which would be the subject of revival, was one that I, I it, let me say it this way. The Lord um, has really helped me. <laughs> and what I mean is, you know, I'm, I'm pointing a certain direction with my life and my passions related to wanting to serve the kingdom. And many times the Lord's redirected me in a really helpful way. I, I don't know that I would have been about revival having grown up as a new believer in the midst of the 90s renewals and the moves of the Spirit. And as a person from an unsaved home, I didn't understand what was going on. I wasn't sure that I liked it. And in that season, the Lord helped me related to the subject of revival. And then beyond that, it was the same thing with the return of Jesus and the unique dynamics surrounding his return. It wasn't a subject I had any passion for and didn't find very useful in my 20s. But again, the Lord really apprehended me on that subject uh, with a really profound and dramatic encounter that uh, I describe in a different book. But, um, but uh, in that encounter, the Lord made clear that, that he is returning. And the thing that strikes me in the midst of that encounter is the thought that I'd never had before, that, uh, that no one I, on the earth that I know is ready for that man to come through that door that I had seen, that, that I saw in the encounter. That no, and I had the thought, same thought twice. It hits me again. No one I know on the earth is ready for that man to come through that door and return. And so I hadn't really ever thought about the return of Jesus. I hadn't thought about it in context to revival. And I hadn't thought about the need to prepare for it or readiness related to what the Lord's doing on the earth. Now, of course, it's 18 years later. That was about 18 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, 18 years later, things are becoming more evident and obvious, which the closer we get, the clearer things get. If we're staying connected to the heart of the Lord and staying aligned with Him in prayer and the Word, things become clearer. History catches up to the Bible, in essence. And so, uh, so the conviction that I had coming into this was, was a was a conviction from the place of prayer and from a, a hunger for the Word. But um, but yeah, it's it's very true. I, I was writing these things having no idea what was about to happen. No one did in 2020, and so. Um, and so, yeah, that was, uh, even in the book itself, you'll find there's things I'm writing about in fall of 2019 that, that uh, I, I'm thinking to myself, I hope people get what I'm saying. Because I'm talking about the French Revolution. I'm talking about um, critical race theory. I'm talking about, um, you know, cultural Marxism. I'm talking about cultural indicators of the rage in the human heart against the Lord and his word. Mm -hmm. and, and at the time, I'm thinking, I don't think anyone's going to be tracking with what I'm saying. I don't even know why I'm writing this. And so then, of course, you know, a year later, things are much clearer now in ways that, that we didn't anticipate. And so um, even I'm, I myself am alerted 
by things that I wrote that I didn't fully grasp at the time in terms of the timing. Yeah, it's so good. It's so good because when I was reading and I was like, oh, this is what I was saying back at the beginning of the year when everything started. And you put into words what I was trying to articulate that I was feeling in the spirit. And so as I was reading your book, knowing the timetable, knowing that this message had been in you for a while, and when you were probably writing the book before you had to turn it in to be edited, I was like, the Holy Spirit was all over this book, David. The Holy Spirit was all over this. And really, I think it is the answer to really what the church needs to understand in this season and in the seasons to come. And I don't think that we all really fully understand what we're experiencing. And I think you did a really great job in here. Now, I want to talk about a couple of concepts that you talk about. And you talk about this early in your book. You say that there are three things coming in the days ahead. Great glory, great crisis, and great judgment. And, uh, you know, the question is, you know, do you really think that the church is equipped for these realities? And we talked a little bit about that, but can you dive in just a little bit to give people a little snippet of the great glory, the great crisis, and the great judgment, and kind of what you're talking about there? Yeah, so yeah, I think that that message in one sense would resonate the most with the, the tribe that you and I run with. In, in one sense, you know, I'm writing for a broader audience, an evangelical audience that for who may be unfamiliar with the subject of revival. Mm -hmm. But I find that even um, spirit-filled audiences, when it comes to the subject of revival, and and I say this with with all tenderness, there's a little bit of naivete around the subject. There's an accidental um, sentimentality and an accidental reducing of revival um, because of the distance between now this present moment and say for example the welsh revival or the azusa street revival or even going back to the first and second great awakening um there's a little bit of naivete on the subject as it relates to how disruptive god in the midst can be we want god to invade our reality we want his presence we want his power but as we're contending for power from the place of prayer from works of justice As we're contending for more of God, we have to reckon with what that means in a society that wants less of God. And so the so the naivete is twofold. It's it's a naivete about the realities of the human heart when confronted with God in a way that has to be reckoned with, uh, both believer and unbeliever alike. Um, And then, of course, the dynamics of the disruptive presence of God itself, just in a really simple way. Just imagine, you know, Kansas City has about 1.1 million in the metro area. If 300,000 came to Christ in a really dramatic, sudden, and powerful way, just the, in the natural, just the way that that shifts the political arena, the whole political scene in Kansas City turns overnight because now there's 300,000 that want very different things for their city than they did the day before. Yeah. And, and what that means in terms of the politics, in terms of the social dynamics, in terms of the economics, we haven't thought through the practicalities of a sudden invasion of God's glory and how that disrupts everyone's life. Yeah. Uh, not, it, we think it improves ours, but it, but it may, it may, it's unlikely, but it, it improves ours at the expense of somebody else that wanted things the way that they were. And so, um, or had become used to the way things were as it relates to their economic standing. Yeah. So those kinds of collisions are just even before we get to the more intense parts of the book, just that dramatic salvations on a mass scale is something we don't even think about. We need to prepare for that. Right. And, uh, And the Lord's heart is so kind and so tender as a father to, to help align us and get us ready for the things we're not even thinking about. He's so kind in his leadership. Yeah, he really is. And as you were reading, um, as you were writing this, and I was reading this, I was, I came to page like 29. So this is early on the book. And you talked about politics, power, and the prophetic witness. And you said this, you said, one of the greatest issues facing the church today is the manner in which we as people are guided more by ideologies and emotions than we are by theology and devotion. And I was like, underline, highlight, bold, ask him this question because I, I was like, this, this is so good. I mean, you really talk about how people gravitate towards and argue about each side, but they use fear 
And I think we're seeing that played out today in the political arena, today in everything that's going on in 2020, and um, really in many of the major cities here across the nation, um, as fear being this powerful tool to motivate allegiance in order to acquire and keep power. So can you talk to me a little bit about um, ideologies and emotions versus theology and devotion? We're... Yes, we're swimming in it right now, aren't we? I mean, yes. we are in the midst of very cultural arguments, and, and they're being driven by both sides of a political debate. And the church, strangely, I find on both sides, I find that there's a more liberal or democratic, Democrat sympathetic side to the church, and there's a more conservative, Republican sympathetic side to the church. And they tend to, in moments like these, adopt those talking points. Mm -hmm. And they adopt those philosophical and ideological viewpoints. And, and the church, I mean, in one sense, we, we are, as the writer of Hebrews said, we are strangers. We are aliens. We're, 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 we're temporary residents on our way to a heavenly country. Yeah. And therefore, we shouldn't fit in as tightly as we do with cultural dialogues and cultural conversations. We should be sounding very different as it relates to the, the heart of Jesus and expressing him in this moment. And, uh, and so I, I find that we tend to get lost in the noise rather than having a prophetic sound. But, I, but again, I, I believe the Lord in his kindness, he's going to restore a unified prophetic sound to the church in a way that sounds like his son. Um, yeah. I'll, can I say, I'll say something mildly mean. I hope this is okay. You can say it. <laughs> I, I'm in Brazil with a pastor and, um, and he, he says, I'm so sorry. I need to take this call. He takes a phone call and, uh, he tells me, he goes, it's a, it's a prophetic man from Florida had a prophetic word for me. And I said, let me guess. It's about increase. It's about more. It's about more influence. It's about there's more better things are about to happen to you. He goes, that's exactly what he said. He goes, did you get that from the Lord too? I go, no. I guessed he was an American prophet because American prophets always prophesy more. They rarely sound like the prophets of the Bible. They, they always sound like cultural prophets of better times. Yeah. And, uh, and that, that just, they speak to what the heart wants at times more than what it seems like the Lord is saying. Yeah. And if I were to guess what the Lord's saying, it would sound more like repent. It would sound more like take stock of your own life and align with me versus better days are coming. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not saying that better days are or are not coming. It's just, it's just mildly um, sad to me that I could pick out an American prophet quite easily related to the message that seems to speak more to what comforts me today versus the ultimate comfort of the Lord's heart and what he wants to do. Yeah. And I think it's really important, you know, as people operate in prophecy or even as prophets um, speak out the word of the Lord, that we're really hearing the word of the Lord coming from heaven and hearing his voice and not necessarily picking up on the other things to, um, what do we say? Tickle the ears. Yeah. Yeah. And to, see is the testimony of Christ Jesus. Absolutely. Again, that's my, that's my encouragement, my excitement about where the church is going under the leadership of the good shepherd. It's a church that's going to prophesy the beauty of Jesus. Yeah. You know that it's prophetic when it doesn't just sound like Jesus, but it actually points to Jesus and it actually describes him from a place of actually knowing him an intimate detail of who he is. The greatest need for the world right now is to know Jesus. And the greatest role that the church can play is to introduce the world to the Jesus of the Bible. Yeah. And that's where I'm, what I'm excited about is where that is going. The Lord is going to take us there. Yeah, he, he really is because he, he are, he already ordained that. And I, you talk about this early on in the book, really about the revival and the rage of nations, but it all comes down to loving people. And I think that was, my husband and I also pastor a church out here um, in Lacey, Washington. And that was something that the Lord put on our heart like two summers ago. We had the summer of love, which is really quite funny because, you know, here we are just an hour south of Seattle. And what is, what are they saying? This is a summer of love. It is not the summer of love, but, but, but 
we as believers have to love in spite of what's happening because that's what Jesus Christ modeled for us. And that's why I thought your book was such a right now message. And I wanted to get this um, to my viewers and my listeners. Um, you talk about Joel 2, 28 uh, through 32, and you talk about uh, four expressions of God's power in this particular chapter. And you can you unpack, because I think we as believers, especially those of us that move in um, the prophetic, we've heard Joel 2, 28, but the way that you unpack it is just a little bit different. And I really appreciated that. So can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, the global outpouring of the Holy Spirit in context to Joel 2, 28? Yes, there's, there's so many beautiful layers to that passage. Yeah. And, uh, and, and again, I think what's, What's probably most important is to set that prophecy in the future. Uh, in some circles, it's it's understood as being kind of done at Acts two, and yeah. and, uh, and I, I view Acts two as Peter advertising that which was going to come in the future and pointing to the down payment of what was happening in Jerusalem as an indicator. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think Peter was saying this is that it's all done. Joel two's finished because there are elements of Joel 2 that weren't happening in Jerusalem in the first century, which would include, you know, the moon, uh, the, the signs in the heavens, and of course, Joel 3 to follow. Peter was saying, we know that something like this is coming. This is the beginning of that. This is the down payment of that. This is the beginning of where it's going. Well, where is it going? Where it's going is a, is a global expression of what was happening locally. And that's important to understand, even before we get to the details of Joel 2. It's important because you have to study what happened locally mm -hmm. to get a feel for what's going to happen globally. The book of Acts is a local sneak preview of a global outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And uh, I call, for example, the book of Revelation, the global book of Acts. Mm -hmm. The book of Acts was the local version of the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is the global version. Yeah. And, and, and again, we tend to approach Revelation depending on our stream and our bent. Some people focus on the negative of Revelation, and some people focus on the positive of Revelation. And in the same manner, we, it's funny, we don't do that with Acts. We only do that with our future. Nobody talks about the book of Acts and goes, man, there was so much persecution, and those guys were jailed, and guys were martyred. It was really hard. Yeah. Nobody talks about it and goes, wow, there was only glory. No. When we talk about our past, we tend to talk about it more honestly than how the Bible describes our future. Yeah. And, and the book of Acts is both. The book of Acts is this, this, this down payment of an outbreak of glory like Joel 2 that creates all kinds of disruption in Jerusalem and backlash. Mm -hmm. We actually see the backlash and we actually see the trouble, but then we see the Lord break in in the midst of the trouble and encourage and equip the church. And again, that's our sneak preview. But yeah. but Joel two gets more specific, and I, I know I'm going a little long. But no, you're good. No, you're good. This is good. Don't worry about it. Joel two going with the direction of the Holy Spirit. So keep going, David. I love that. I really. Do. <laughs> um, Joel two gets more specific and and gives us this this picture, not just of global shaking at the hand of the Lord, but it's shaking through an awakened and empowered people. Mm -hmm. it, and the, of course, in that context, the shocker would be. It's not just the one anointed man anointed to dream dreams and prophesy, but Joel goes, no, it's all hands on deck. Every young person you know is going to prophesy. So that would have been a shock to the ancient Jewish mind. Yeah. Like the Lord's going to anoint a young person like he did Amos or Ezekiel. And, and Joel's saying, yeah, the Lord is going to anoint to prophesy. Every young person that loves, loves Yahweh mm -hmm. in that context loves Yeshua, loves Jesus. Yeah. But the Lord's not going to forget about the older ones as well. The older ones are going to dream dreams, which in part means they're going to be encouraged. They're going to be leaning in. They're not going to be fatalistic and wondering why they were passed by. Everyone is activated and everyone is engaged. But in the midst of some very dramatic heavenly signs that are creating great disruption mm -hmm. on the earth. And so you get in Joel 2 this beautiful picture of an activated, empowered church. God intervening directly in the midst of it, and the earth very troubled because of it. You get kind of all three pictures. Yeah, which I thought was 
so great because it added such another layer to, I think, what the traditional church and even the charismatic streams and the flow and the prophetic really talked about. And I really, I appreciated your take on that. And and you talked a little bit about this too. And when what you were just saying, which leads into my next thing that I wanted to talk about, which was the book of Acts, that you actually say in the book that the book of Acts is actually a look back to look forward because like, especially today, you know, pastoring, people are like, we got to be like the, the church in Acts. We're the church in Acts. And I'm like, okay. Like they're like, it's this. And I'm like, it's not this or this it's both. It's not an either, or it's an, and, and I say that to people and they're like, huh? <laughs> so when I was reading this, I was like, oh, thank you. I actually have now another layer that I can bring to conversations because you do talk about that. You really talk about how um, the book of Acts is looking back to look forward, that, it, that we must prepare our hearts and orient our lives so that we can endure with joy and perseverance in the days to come. And that's the, the church isn't known for its joy and endurance, at least not the American church. And that's what we always say to people, you know, when we're thinking about revival, revival um, in theory is really good, but most of us today haven't experienced it. We get to read about it in history. We get to read about it and we look at it through the eyes of what we look at with the book of Acts, but we forget exactly what you talked about, the persecution and, you know, the church under duress and how can we spread the message if we might be thrown in jail? Or And so talk a little bit about, um, a little bit more about that, what that looks like to prepare hearts, to orient our lives, to endure with joy and perseverance. John 15, verse 9, um, Jesus summarizes the answer to that question beautifully. And he says, earlier in John 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. But in John 15, 9, he says, but abide in my love, abide in it, stay connected to me, connect with me. Um, I, I believe that our way forward as the bride of Christ, our best days are ahead as a corporate entity. But the question is, are your best days ahead as an individual believer? Mm-hmm. Because there is a way forward that Jesus given, has given to us, really practical, very simple, but the question is, you know, how seriously do we take these things and how much do we believe that this is coming? You know, the reason we don't examine the practical kind of dynamics of the book of Acts is we don't, we secretly don't believe that's going to happen. Yeah. Um, you know, the, a gospel, Acts 19, that can conquer cities. Do we believe in the midst of a global pandemic, in the midst of burning cities, in the midst of racial conflict that, that uh, we haven't seen in 40 years? That's, that's escalating to another level in the midst of the intensity do we believe that we adhere to a gospel that can conquer cities mm-hmm. still do we believe that if we believe that then we have this play-by-play manual that's been given to us from heaven here's what happens when the gospel takes cities it's like wait what yeah here's what happens when it happens when that happens it actually is very economically disruptive and when it disrupts corrupt, wicked economies, can, you know, interwoven to darkness, when light shines in those places, there will be rage. And so now the question is, do we want revival? And are we ready for the backlash that comes? Jesus gives us the answer. He goes, no, abide in me. Stay, like, do the, the really simple but daily small labor of connecting with me. It's finding the gaps in our day and just talking with them and connecting with his heart and opening our Bible and talking to him from the word. They're very simple actions we can take, um, very small things. They're not difficult. But again, we get so drowned by the cultural narrative. We get so overwhelmed by the, by the pressure and we get so thrown off by the dynamics that we, it dislodges us from intimacy with Jesus And the problem is, if we get dislodged in 2020, which to me, as as tough as this year has been, it's a pop quiz compared to where this is going. Yeah. And and the pop quiz is the Lord's kindness to to allow it to to say to his church, okay, you you were dislodged. These were intense things, but these were small things in comparison to where it's going. 
can you turn to me? Can you lay hold of me? I'll help you for the next round. And I'll help you for the round after that. I will help you, church. But I'm calling you to lay hold of me and to abide in me and to connect with me in small ways throughout your day from the word. Add singing where, where you can. Add singing my word. Add listening for my, for my voice. But, uh, but reach for me, church. And the more Jesus-oriented we are in our secret prayer life, the more we're preparing ourselves to not be thrown off. We didn't have to be thrown off by this year. We can be surprised by it, but not disrupted or disturbed in our soul. And, and we can be stable. We can live a life that can bear the weight of what's coming. We can live a life that where everyone else around us is buckling in fear and in anger and in lust and in, and in, and in confusion. The church can be a stable force of gentle mercy that, that uh, had prepared with stable hearts and real joy in the midst of it. That the joy in the midst of the storm is the witness to the confused, lost unbeliever, broken in fear, mm-hmm. a joyful, stable-hearted church is such a powerful witness. Really and and uh, that's what the Lord wants to bring us into. That's so good. David, that is so good. I, I really appreciate it. Like even this part that we talked about, and then you really talk about wrestling out the cost of revival and that it's going to be high, but the reward is great. But this piece at the very end of your book caught me. And I just want to, um, you said this, you said that it's going to be irresponsible to prophesy revival and do nothing to prepare the next generation for it. And I think I was like, Yes, because revival has been prophesied for as long as I've been in the church. And I was in a conservative church when I was growing up. So in the last 25 years, being in a charismatic stream, I've heard revival preached, but nobody's actually prepared me for it. And I'm thinking, how do we prepare that next generation? And so um, talk just a little bit as we wrap up today's podcast with that, like why why is it irresponsible to prophesy revival and not to prepare the next generation? And in a nutshell, because it's way too much longer than this, it's a whole nother podcast episode about how we prepare the next generation. But can you give us a little snippet of that? Yeah, I find, again, I'll say this a little, well, direct. That's okay. For time's sake. Um, I find that we live in the rhetoric and the hype of rallying people to a revival message Mm. that in our practice uh, reveals our unbelief that revival is actually going to come at the level that the Bible prophesies. We don't actually, if we believed the things that we proclaimed, if we believed the message that we're rallying young people to, then there would be a sobriety in our heart related to both the book of Acts and church history. But when church history shows us the outcomes of revival, I mean, the American Revolution, the, the, the British Empire, the King of England was more terrified of the men in the pulpits than he was the soldiers with arms, mm-hmm. the revolutionaries. They were terrified of the men with, with, uh, with the Bible in the pulpits, rallying the people to a morality that would throw off oppression. Yeah. The, when, 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 the, when the Lord moves, and transforms the morality of a people. There are consequences related to a culture built on immorality. Mm-hmm. We've got to prepare young people for the counter hit that comes by people that want things to stay as they are. There is an agenda underneath, a demonically fueled agenda of men, of wicked men in power that want things to remain as they are so their wealth remains, their power remains. It's either the acquisition of it or the protection of it. Either side, the group that wants to get it or the group that wants to keep it, both of the agendas fueling the reach for power aren't interested in the church coming into its power. And so we're really teaching young people to navigate the subject of power with humility and meekness and tenderness. We're trying to take our God who is a lamb that was slain and develop disciples that are lamb-like disciples that follow the lamb wherever he goes, that though power is given to them, it does not corrupt them because power was never their end. Love was the end. Mm -hmm. We've got to get young people connected to the narrative of the love of Jesus as our everything. And power is just a way to fill the earth with that end. 
It's not our end in terms of our own comfort, our own fame, our own honor. The yeah. things that people want power for, we've got to be intentional in our discipleship to get young people out of that narrative and that twisted dream. Yeah, that's so good because, you know, as you're talking right now, I'm even thinking about, you know, the church when Jesus came, they were looking for somebody to come in power to take back the kingdom. And he just came in love. Let me show you the way to live. Let me show the, you the way to love. Let me show you the way to preach the gospel to people so that they understand it. And so just listening to you, that's the that's a piece that I think that the church misses. Like we, we say, we have this saying in our church, my husband says this, um, simple, no. You know, it's, it's, we say revival, we cry out for revival, but we don't actually understand what comes with it because there is, we're in America, we're so privileged that it usually takes something like what's going on in 2020 or even what happened at 9-11 to really shake people to the core to realize, wait a second, we've removed God from our lives. And I think for that next generation coming up and even for uh, the generations that exist right now, we have to understand, and you do so beautifully in The Nation's Rage, Prayer, Promise, and Power in an Anti-Christian Age. You lay it out so well, David. So thank you for being obedient to writing the message of the Lord in this hour and for stewarding it for really 18 years, you said, that the Lord had begun speaking to you about that. So thank you for sharing that with us during this season. Thank you so much. This has been so encouraging. I really oh, appreciate it. Oh, good. Well, I'm so glad to have you on. Um, can you tell our viewers and our listeners how they can connect with you, how they can get copies of When the Nations Rage? The easiest way to do it is davidslyker.com. If okay. they go there, it's kind of the one stop to connect with me on social media, to lay hold of the, the book and anything else they're looking for in terms of materials and equipping on these subjects and many other. Okay, wonderful. Well, can you um, pray us out of today's episode before I wrap up? Just whatever God puts on your heart uh, for our viewers and listeners today. Yes, Heavenly Father, we come before you. We ask, Philippians 1.9, that love would abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. God, I'm asking that you would help us to approve the things that are excellent. I'm asking that you would help us to lay hold of the things that matter. In an hour like this, that you would increase our discernment to prioritize and to align with the things that are your priority and your concern. Lord, we're asking that you would help us as a people to be filled with the fruits of righteousness, that our lives would align, that our hearts would align, that we would be filled with the fruit of a life connected to your heart and your spirit. I'm asking, Lord, that you would cut through the noise. I'm asking that you would cut through the fog of confusion, the agendas. I'm asking that like a, an unstoppable light, you would shine on our understanding, our hearts, our children, our grandchildren. I'm asking, Lord, that you would empower us to hand them something beautiful that's, that's eternal in, in quality, that's, that's glorious and beautiful and worthy of your name. Equip us, Lord, as mothers and fathers, as shepherds and leaders. Equip us, not just to grow and love ourselves, but to pass it on in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Thank you, David, so much for that. And I'll have all of the link, I'll have your link for your website in the show notes. So people just need to click on that and they can go straight to your website to connect with you. This is such a right now message, the nation's rage, prayer, promise, and a power in an anti-Christian age. So again, David, thank you for stewarding this message and for um, being obedient to release and being obedient to speak from the heart straight truth and not watering it down because that's exactly what we need today. Thank you. Well, this is uh, Dare to Hear. Thank you for listening. I'm Debbie Kitterman. If you were encouraged in any way, we would be delighted and honored if you would subscribe to our YouTube channel or to our podcast on your favorite podcast station. And most importantly, share this message with your friends so that we can get out the message about David's book. And it's a right now message for the word. So until next week, God bless and have a great week. Cause there's me
that cause 